Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Winkler again. When I was in the Navy, we would often start out the first meeting of the day or whatever we were going to do for drill. And we would say, it's a fine Navy day. Well, can I turn that around and say it's a fine history day? Uh, I guess that's a little cheeky. But it's a good day. Uh, and I hopefully you'll enjoy this as much as I'm going to enjoy this. Uh, having mentioned that I was in the Navy Reserves, probably something I should have said about myself in introducing the course. Yes, I was in the Navy Reserves. So, yes, I'm a veteran. But you have to be careful about my understanding. I think my military experience gives me certain insights as to what it was like to serve during the First World War. But I was not a combat soldier. I was never involved in that experience. I want to tell you I have empathy for these men's experience. I have read a lot of their stories. I've interviewed veterans. I have some veterans from Vietnam primarily that told me a lot about their experiences. So I have insights, but there's a certain level of understanding I will never achieve. And quite frankly, I'm very pleased that I can say that I've never been in combat because I honestly believe to be deployed in a rifle company in wartime is one of the worst of all possible human experiences. Later on in the course, we will talk about the experience of the trenches. But I just wanted to tell you kind of where I'm coming from. So it's a fine Navy day. Well, if you're in the Navy, it is. It's a fine history day. Let's proceed. Last time we were talking about <clears throat> the various questions on casualties, fatalities in the First World War. Remember I said last time, talking about, well, what is the official line? Why did nations actually say that they had lost? And we come up with a figure about 8.5 million. Uh, that could be accurate. On the other hand, I'm skeptical because different nations calculate this different ways. However, an estimate on the number of civilian dead might put it around 6 million. And we can end up with a total, therefore, 15 million human beings that died. Now, other estimates. Remember, I'm old school. I do have a tendency to believe that these numbers are modest for several reasons, one of which is it is to the government's advantage, sometimes politically, to downplay the number of men who have died. So I look, just take a look at other estimates, 11 million. This is the one I kind of buy into. However, I've seen estimates higher than this. It's, always, it's quite a bit higher, actually. You could go as high as 15 million men dead. 10 to 12 million civilians. Remember, these are higher estimates. Um, the numbers you can see going up quite a bit. And then the highest estimates I have seen is 24 to 26 million dead total. This is civilians and military. I, I, I don't know. I, I hope that's not correct. Nonetheless, it's hard to hard to prove. I would simply go back and probably say it's probably something less than that. I would hope no more than maybe 15, 17 million, but I do not know. Whatever numbers you want to think are the best. Can we say that a generation here is destroyed by war? I think we can say that. You see, this is a horrific, if you take a look at the number and percentage of men who die in the heavy belligerents, Russia, Germany, France, Austria, Britain, you're going to come up with very, very large numbers, very, very large percentages. Now, remember, you can be destroyed by war and have, having, and having survived the war. It's not just the men who are dead. There are men who are maimed. We'll talk about that later. Uh, some people say it is for every man who's dead, there is a man who's permanently maimed, not just wounded, permanently maimed. That means you're insane. That means you're missing an arm, leg, or you're blind, something like this. So those people aren't really in these numbers, are they? Uh, one thing I would like to point out, that usually in a World War I battle, for every man killed, there's two men wounded. This is because... The wounds tend to be horrific. I'll talk more about weapons in just a few minutes. A few minutes. 
the wounds do have a tendency to be horrific. There's no doubt about that at all. There's also uh, a, a tendency for you not to be able to get the man to treatment as rapidly as you should. Let's make a contrast in Vietnam. For every man who dies in Vietnam, there's what, eight, ten wounded? You know, wow, that's a very, very difference between two and one. <laughs> eight to ten to one versus two to one. Vietnam, we have much better medicine. We have antibiotics. We have the ability, remember medevac helicopters come in, pick up our wounded, and get them to an operating table very, very rapidly. So advances here do have a tendency to save lives. But that does not in any way negate, negate what we're talking about. A generation is destroyed by war. Now let's take a look at some other issues here. This is one of the, in modern war, this is one of the more unusual aspects of the First World War. As you well know, wars have been going on for thousands of years. As we look at the various wars, and I already mentioned the Civil War as an example of a war that doesn't have advanced medicine. And we actually have more men dying, okay, Civil War, like two to one, more men dying from disease than actually die from the effects of combat. But this is different in World War I. Can we say this is the first major time in history? You actually have more men dying from battle than from disease. Even when the flu pandemic hits the trenches in 1918, killing large numbers of young men, even taking that into account, you still have more men dying from disease. Excuse me, you have more men dying from battle. We talk about a generation destroyed by war, and we talk about the percentage of men who die. We, we have to take into account a few issues. You see, we, we fight modern wars. We're fighting wars right now in, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan. Men are killed. Men from my home state of Utah are killed. The ones I'm aware of being killed is a, a young man was killed up in Kaysville. Well, I haven't been in Kaysville since I played high school, high school baseball. I mean, then, then there's a man who was killed down in, from Spanish Fork. I only go down to Spanish Fork once every six, eight months or something like this to watch maybe a high school football game. People I don't know, people I've never heard of, are end up being our fatalities in, in this war. See, that's very, very different than a huge conflagration. It's very, very different than when you're putting virtually every able-bodied man you can in uniform and you send him up to the front and where the casualty rates are very, very high. That's a very, very different kind of thing. Let me make this a little bit personal. A friend of mine in high school, actually I'm being too narrow, Mike and I were, let's go back to here again. Mike and I were uh, Boy Scouts together, you know, like 12 years of age. Uh, we were on the baseball team. Good old T for Tuella. Yeah, Mike's a full-blooded Navajo. One of the high school yearbook pitchers. Uh, I do regret one thing about what we're looking at here, and that is the quality of these photographs isn't very high. Now, these were taken from, from my, my high school yearbook. Uh, not mine personally, but our high school yearbook. Nice kid. Um, Boy Scouts together on the baseball team together high school baseball team. He get some pictures down here. Let's go back. I have it's always the same, isn't it? Everything works well until you until you try to do it in public. 
Okay, nice guy. Uh, we were on the football team together. We were on the baseball team together. Uh, I was this a pitcher a junior year, my junior year, not his senior year, in high school baseball. And I don't know what it's like in your hometown or where you grew up, but there is a tendency for the nice guys to quit playing sports because the jerks push them out. And my hometown, there's a lot of jerks. Oh, there's a lot of jerks. And they tend to, you know, if you try to be nice, and they, they're mean to you. And if you not don't retaliate, then you end up getting your feelings hurt and end up quitting. Mike befriended me. I don't know why he liked me. He seemed to like me. He always called me buddy. Hey, buddy, you can do it, buddy. Don't take it so hard, buddy. He, that, was, that was very nice of him. I always felt good about that. Then Mike went into the Marine Corps. I don't know if he joined. I don't know if he drafted. If he was drafted, I don't know. You go to the baseball team here. The guy right here, grinning like he doesn't know any better. That's me. I would have been 17 minutes. Photograph was taken a long time ago now. I can tell you a story about a lot of these people. Some of these people are dead. Let me tell you about this guy right here. This is Dale Richards. Boy, I thought a lot of Dale. I thought he was so cool. He was not a real friend of mine, but he was so cool. He was always happy and very athletic. After high school, we went down to Snow College. We happened to be there at the same time. And at Snow College, he was an athlete. and I think he played basketball. I envied this guy. He was so cool and he was so fun. And he was... He, you know, really had the good with the one-liners. I envied him. Boy, I want to be like him. Never quite pulled that off. Years ago, after I had my PhD in history, and I'm going to a history convention in Colorado where, you know, the eight kids get together and talk about various aspects of history. And so I'm driving through Green River. You know, you come down, you go up. Spanish Fort Canyon price down to I-70 and I stopped at Green River to buy gas and I stopped in this gas and go go place and there's there's Dale Richards still cool still good looking he's pumping gas in a he was nice we, we recognized each other we changed a few words but he uh had a different tack in life and maybe he's completely happy with his life. But uh, when I started thinking about what he was doing versus what I was doing, I think I'm a little bit better off trying to be a historian than trying to pump gas. Anyway, I digress badly. This is Mike right here. And of course, I've already mentioned this is me. Mike was killed in March 1969 with the Marines. According to the records, it was gunshots and those were shot to death. Finer man than I've ever been. 19 years old. Finer man than I've ever been. And he ends up being killed. When you look at the cost of a really big war, you're going to find an awful lot of people that are fine men too. So, my point of discussion over here. Fine men die. Yes, they do. Fine men die. They're, they're, they are maimed. Steve Van Vliet, wonderful kid, really enjoyed him. We used to joke he liked a good laugh. He survived. He came back from Vietnam. Never smiles, never laughs. Try to be friendly with him. He just simply can't handle a conversation anymore. Uh, some guys go insane. Some guys kill themselves. One of the guys in my high school class went to Vietnam. He never even arrived at his military position. They flew him in. He got on a convoy going down the highway. I think it's Highway 1 in Vietnam. They were ambushed and he was killed before he ever got to his unit. Uh, there was a kid in my high school named King. Very nice boy. He took a ball in the back of the head and blew up part of his face. In other words, there was there was a uh, socket, uh, socket. 
there was a hole right here where his eye, eye had been. He could still see his other eye. He came back and lived that way for a while, and then he killed himself. Uh, there was another man, man my age in high school. He came back from the war, and uh, he had a drinking problem. Drove into the garage one night, closed the doors on the garage, left the engine running, and died. Whoa. See, and this is Vietnam. Not everybody in my high school went to Vietnam. But had I been a World War I generation, born anywhere from, what, 1880 to 1900, it would be virtually every able-bodied man in my high school class and my high school for many, many years who've had that experience. See, it's not small during the First World War. It's very large. Oh, by the way, Mike's girlfriend was Nikki. Nikki Higgins, very fine, fine lady. Thought a lot of her, still do actually. Every five years at the high school class reunion, uh, I see her. We sometimes talk a little bit. I'm talking to a lot of people. They talk a little bit. And she told me that he was the only man she ever loved. She ever loved. She never married. She's the same age as I am, so we're quite advanced in years nowadays. But to this day, she's still feeling the loss of someone who's very near and dear to her. So who dies when you have that kind of loss? If you're a mother, it was a little boy who crawled up on your lap and said, don't cry, mommy. If you're a child, it was the father that held you when you were sick. It's the brother that befriended you on the soccer field. It's the guy who got you through high school algebra. It's the finest man you ever knew and the only man you ever loved. That's who dies. Please, as we talk about this, please, as we take a look at this, all we're seeing appears ink on a page. That's all it is, isn't it? Please don't think in such terms that you forget that each one of those integers, each one of those is a living, breathing human being who had friends, family, and loved and had accomplishments in their life and their lives were cut short in a very miserable way. Find men who could have lived a very decent life. Please don't get lost in the numbers. It can literally be horrific. Well, we're going to talk about the huge casualties in the First World War. Huge casualties. And we got to give you an explanation as to why you have that kind of thing. <clears throat> Let's talk about the advances in weapons while tactics lag behind. You see, you have advances in weapons. Now make a big deal about this. We call these defensive weapons, rifles, rapid fire, fire artillery, machine guns. They have the ability to throw an awful lot of bullets very, very fast. You see, that's defensive weapons. Somebody comes out at me and I can boom, boom, boom. There's all kinds of things I can do. However, if you are trying to do the offensive, how do you take the offensive? Uh, we're going to see this many, many times, many, many times during the First World War. You get a bunch of guys going out there. Okay, everybody forward. You blow the whistle, you wiggle your cane, you make a gesture, and you all go into a horrific amount of material they can throw at you. One of the reasons why we have such viciously high casualties in the First World War is the nature of weaponry. But you figure out how to kill people if they're attacking, it's very difficult to attack. We'll talk more about this as the class continues. Let's take a look at weapons. We're coming down here to page two. Okay, what has happened? I like to use the Civil War as a point of departure because many Americans know a lot about the Civil War. Uh, during the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, we have what we call powder. We call it black powder. Even though it's black powder, when it fires, you see big white smoke. Poof! goes out. Now, using better chemical techniques, where there's a better burning, if you will, of the actual material itself, it burns more completely. Therefore, there's less residue and there's less powder, less smoke blowing out. 
So we, we still call it powder, even though by the time it's, it's granulated. In fact, people that are very, very careful, like re reloading shells, for example, they'll actually say this, there's so many grains that goes in each shell. What does this mean in comparison, in comparing Civil War weapons with World War I weapons? Well, it's going to be more accuracy, no doubt about that at all. The velocity, we call it muzzle velocity, the speed of the bullet coming out of the barrel is much enhanced. So longer distance, longer distance. You can go out a lot farther, a lot faster, and use smaller caliber. The typical World War, excuse me, typical Civil War musket, and they did vary somewhat, but the typical Civil War musket, musket is like 58 caliber. Remember, a caliber is one one hundredth of an inch. So 58 caliber is 58th one hundredths of an inch. Uh, even though, relatively speaking, the muzzle velocity, the velocity of the, shell, the bullet, is actually relatively small. They are made out of soft lead. When this hit flesh, they flatten, and uh, they can really do severe damage. These are very, very dangerous weapons. During the First World War, the, sip, the typical caliber is much less, like 30 caliber. They vary a little bit, but largely 30 caliber. Uh, the bullet goes much faster. Uh, much more accurate, and though it's illegal to have the bullet warp when it hits your body, it hits with such force that it does severe damage. This is not my pur purpose to discuss the entirety the the, in, the entirety of <clears throat> of uh, World War One weapons, but I want to give you an idea of what is there. There is a magnificent gun called the French 75. 75 means 75 millimeters. What's that? Three some odd inches? Something like that. So that's that's the width of the artillery shell. We call it the French 75, but it is, I think technically speaking, the French call it the Modèle, Modèle, the Model 1897. Why is this a big deal? It is a large technical breakthrough in artillery. Let's go back to the Civil War. When you, let's pull up a Civil War cannon. When you fire a Civil War cannon, so we got one up here, I can look at it easily. Firing a Civil War cannon. Yeah, I'm on YouTube now. Firing the Civil War cannon. Let's not take, I can describe, I think, for you just as well. Get my hands, helpful if I get my hands in the right place. Uh, it's, it's a tube. It, it has a touch hole in the back. What you do is you simply, when you're firing this, and remember these are very lethal weapons. Let's look, look at this one, for example. Uh, the Americans essentially gave an indication as the nature of the cannon by the weight of the ball. A six pounder shoots a six pound ball. A nine pounder shoots a nine pound ball. The more typical weapons during the Civil War was the 12 pounder. So you have a ball coming out that weighs 12 pounds. What you would do is this. You'd simply put the powder in here. You put, that's the charge. And then you'd put the cannonball, have some wadding there too. But you put the cannonball inside there. And there's a touch hole, which you really can't see on any of these things. You would, there's a touch hole back here. You'd, you'd have, sometimes you'd use, use actually a flame, but usually there was a small device there that would cause a spark. You'd spin that, and the spark would go in the powder, and the thing would discharge. When it discharged, there's recoil. Boom. It pushed, pushed the cannon back considerably. So to fire that thing again, you have to do more than one thing. You have to push it forward back to its position because the recoil knocked it back. There are sparks remaining inside of that. And you don't want to put powder where there's sparks because it'll blow up in your face. So you have to swab it out with water. You have to have a stick with a wad on the end. You swab it out to knock down all the sparks. Then you put the charge in again. So you can do that. Now you see the process is fairly lengthy. Something else that's important about this is 
this is a very dangerous weapon because after you fired it, you push it forward. But when you reload it, you and the other men in your group have to stand in front of the cannon to reload it. So it's slow. It's dangerous. Of course, you got the sparks in there. If you get going too fast and put a charge in on top of the spark, you're very, very unfortunate. So what the French 75 does, there's been a number of attempts in using springs, this kind of thing, to absorb the recoil. This is the first highly successful gun that has a pneumatic, in other words, oil inside of it, that will actually absorb the recoil. I've got to be careful to pull up French 75 because I think that's an alco alcoholic drink. So let me show I'm talking about cannon. You have an idea. The French 75. This is the model 1897. Notice it, so I can get a bigger one for you here. Notice it has a tube underneath it. This helps with the recoil. Remarkable thing about this is several. One of which is you can stand behind the gun when it's being fired. Notice there's a shield right here to protect you from enemy fire. You don't have to stand out here. It absorbs the recoil, so you don't have to re-aim it every time. <clears throat> and the rapidity of fire is absolutely dramatic. Let's go to YouTube and get your French 75 here. So I give you an idea of, of how rapidly these things will fire. Here is, these are Americans firing a French 75. Okay, this runs what, less than a minute? Notice what these men are doing. The United States during the First World War did not bring us very little cell artillery. So what we actually did was buy cannon from the French. Notice that the man pulls the lanyard, it does fire. You shove the shell in there just almost instantaneously. Now this doesn't really give you how, rapid it, how rapidly the thing can fire. For the simple reason that the man is measuring the angle, though they don't change it at any time. They're measuring the angle at every shot. But you really don't have to do this very often because, quite frankly, it's really on the mark. Now let's go back to this one. This is a firing demonstration. You can always plan to a gun. Rational gun owners carry not because it's a weapon, but because it's a Skip the ad here. These are men. These are World War I uniforms that the French used early on. And notice how rapidly this thing fires. Unfortunately, our lieutenant or officer is in the way here. Put the shell in, close it, pull. Put the shell in, close it, pull. Put the shell in, close it, pull. It's in tremendously rapid. A very competent crew during the American Civil War, guys that are very good, could probably fire around every, well, we do, we do say sometimes they could fire three in a minute. More commonly, be like more like two in a minute. Now, that's pretty rapid fire, according to the United States. But look at what they, they can do in comparison here. They just, they're just pouring this out. You can fire tremendously. Under optimal conditions, you would say on the average, you could fire this thing about six to 12 times in a minute. It's a lot more than one, two or three. Under dire circumstances, under for short periods of time, you can do up to 25. That's one every four seconds. If we wanted to count this, we could probably see these men are doing pretty close to that right now. So you can see the tremendous firepower you have with this kind of thing. Now, let's see. Okay, absorbs recoil. Now, the old guns during the, during the First World War, the ones that don't have the recoil mechanism, are still in use. And they really, really rock back. But most of the guns that developed shortly before the war and during the war have this recoil mechanism even the very, very big guns. And the French 75 is a field piece, not, a, not an awfully big gun. <clears throat> it's flat trajectory. It's very, very good against infantry that's moving. One of the problems, however, with the French 75 is that during the 
World War I, well, a lot of the firing is done at men in fixed positions, those men in trenches. The flat trajectory is not as effective. You do need something that goes up and over. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So absorbs recoil, very, very rapid firing. And when it explodes, remember it's an anti-personnel weapon, it has, it comes out with 300 balls of shrapnel. Shrapnel is just simply an invention by a man by the name of Henry Shrapnel. And Henry Shrapnel came up with the idea, you can see the years he lived, that you would come up with Let me show you what I'm talking about. Image is a shrapnel. I'm not sure that's exactly what I'd like. No, it's not. This gives you an idea a little bit what it's like inside the shell. Maybe this one's better. As no, it's not big enough. <laughs> it's still not big enough. Okay, you have balls in here. That's the shrapnel. You have explosive charge. By turning the top here, called the fuse, you can set it for distance. If you're firing at a, at a target that's close by, you want the fuse to be set to go off more rapidly. If you're firing at a target longer distance, you want to turn that so the fuse was set at a greater distance. There's all kinds of issues during the First World War about shells falling short or going long or exploding at wrong times. When we talk about the shell shortage, which we will discuss later on, we're going to talk about a manufacturing process where you're trying to manufacture as rapidly as you possibly can. And when you do these kinds of things, sometimes the quality control goes down. In other words, sometimes the shells become defective, or at least the fuses become defective, and sometimes they blow off, blow off too soon, and sometimes they blow off too late. So if they go off too soon and you're advancing across the land and, and the explosion is up above you, um, Men say sometimes a shrapnel will almost rain on them like raindrops. However, if that shell is low enough and it explodes, and of course the force of the blast can come down and it can kill you, that's the idea. But if it goes up high enough, uh, the shrapnel just kind of falls down. Now, these are heavy lead balls. Let's see if I can show you what they look like. I have bought some on eBay years ago. And... I had them downstairs, so I was preparing this lecture, went down to look for them, and guess what, you can't find them. Anyway, you can see, here's, here's a uh, angle. Here is a tape measure, so you get the idea how, si how the size of them. Uh, some are bigger, some are smaller. And it depends on what kind of shell you're using now. But this is the idea of how, how they kill people with these things. It's these balls that go out and destroy you. The French, we believe, has like 4,000 of these guns at the beginning of the First World War. In the course of the war, of course, they ratchet up production dramatically. And they're going to add 17,500 more during the war. So by 1918, you're going to have over 20,000 of these things. And their ability to do damage is severe. Now, this is such a, an important gun. This is an, such an important weapon that almost everybody tries to copy them. <clears throat> the British tries to try to copy this in two different guns, one of which is the 18-pounder, another one is the 13-pounder. Now, the French shell coming out are roughly weigh about 15 pounds. So the 18-pounder by the British and the 13-pounder by the British are trying to do about the same thing. The Germans copy this, call the German 77. So the French 75 is 75 millimeters. The German 77 is 77 millimeters. Uh, it's the same idea, rapid fire, anti-personnel weapon. The, th the thing of it is, even with the British and the French, you said that wrong, with the Germans and the British trying to copy the French, nobody ever comes up with a weapon that is actually as good as the French 75. They simply can fire very similarly, but not with the rapidity of the French 75. Now, these other guns are very lethal, and they will do severe damage. So the French 75 is a very big breakthrough. Cannon, I've already mentioned this. This is essentially direct fire. You look out, and you can see 
what you're firing at. They tend to be flat trajectory. That's true of the French. They can only elevate these to only about 15 degrees. Sometimes you actually see during the trench warfare, they take a French 75 because the flat trajectory means it's going to come in and probably hit the ground a little bit more easily rather than going to the trench and do damage. Sometimes the French actually elevate these things, <clears throat> put them on a block or something, elevate them so the shells will come down and do a little more damage in a trench. So direct fire is better to kill men above ground, men that are moving primarily. Shrapnel is good to kill man, but shrapnel is really not good for the trenches. If there's a guy in a trench and a shell goes off right above him, well, you can kill him. The man's in a trench. It's more effective to have a large device, a large shell, come in and hit the trench at a high angle where you can do severe damage and kill more people. So you're going to need uh, different kinds of weapons for different kinds of things during the First World War. Now the howitzers. Howitzers have a tendency to be heavier guns. And we call it indirect fire because you can hit a, hit a position by firing over obstacles. I mean, you didn't have to be able to see the trench you're firing on. It could be on the other side of the hill. But you fire, the shell comes up and down at a heavier angle. This is better for trench warfare. Let's get a howitzer. And let's put it on World War One. Fingers are always in the wrong place. Uh, that's a mortar, actually. That's the Big Bertha. So we can get a few of these things out for you here. As we took a look at the French 75, notice the flat trajectory. Notice the calibers. These things are much larger guns. Here's one in the act of being fired. You can see they, they blow out an awful lot of air uh, coming out quite rapidly. One thing I should mention about the French 75, we're talking about its rate of fire. One of the reasons why you don't want to fire so rapidly over a lengthy period of time, the simple reason is that uh, a lot of heat is produced. If you're shooting even a 22 rifle, a small rifle, bang, 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 and you put your hand on the barrel, the barrels can be very warm. <clears throat> when you have a warm barrel, after a while you get a hot barrel. If you get to the point where the... <clears throat> it is so hot that the barrel starts to melt, you have a big problem because then it'll explode. When the metal warps a little bit, even, even a small amount, the next shell coming through will push that out and it will, it'll explode. Uh, usually there's a four-man crew running a French 75 and sometimes they'll kill all four men. If you do suspect that your barrel, you're firing very rapidly, your barrel's getting hot, you better cool it off. You can pour water on it. The water just evaporates. I shouldn't say evaporates, it kind of burns off because the metal is so hot. What the men would actually do is get blankets or canvas, get the blankets wet, put the blanket on top of the barrel so you keep the water next to the barrel so it cools off faster. But that is an issue when you're talking about using rapid fire devices. The howitzers, you can see larger in, in, uh, in caliber, they do have the steeper angles, so they're better for trench warfare. While the French are interested in movement during the war, they come into war with these thousands of the French 75. The actual, however, the Germans are thinking in terms of attacking French fortified positions. So they tend to have better, heavier guns that are better for trench warfare. So at the beginning of the war, Germany has these heavy guns, these howitzers. The Germans have about 3,500. France has about 300. And Britain has about 10. You can see in the early years, the early months of the First World War, the Germans, as far as trench warfare is concerned, using artillery are going to have a distinct advantage. Now, later on, that advantage is not as profound because France and Britain catch, start catching up. If you... I don't have mortars down here. Sometimes trench mortars are fairly, fairly small devices. If, you, However, they call them mortars because they have a very steep angle. The biggest 
and this is an absolutely huge gun, the biggest trench gun during the war, is the Bertha, the big Bertha. Uh, some people want to call it a howitzer. Some people want to call it a mortar. I guess it depends on your definition of angle. Uh, when it fires, it fires a shell that's 16 and a half inches wide. This is bigger than many naval guns. Obviously, you'd have to have a gun near the coastline, but you could sink it if, if a ship came within range. You could sink a ship with this. It, it is that that horrific? When it fires, it'll break windows two miles around. When it fires, men for acres literally have to scatter because the concussion can do them severe damage. When this thing fires, it goes up like 35,000 feet where modern jet aircraft fly and to come back down at a very, very steep angle. This is made to bust. Yeah, this is, this is made to, to, to bust fortresses, heavy concrete fortresses. We're going to be talking about the Big Bertha in, in other contexts, but let's go ahead and talk about rifles now. The Mauser. First practical repeater. Bolt action developed by the Germans in 1884. First practical repeater. Now, those of you who are familiar with the American West know a lot about lever action weapons. There is a theory that one of the reasons why the 7th Cavalry under George Armstrong Custer got trashed very badly at the Battle of Little Bighorn is that the combat troops, the, the cavalry, were using single-shot rifles. Well, at least some of the Indians, if not many of the Indians, were using lever-action repeaters so they could fire, at least at short range, much more rapidly. Let's go back to YouTube. And let's go to Rifleman. This, when I was a kid, there was a lot of Westerns on TV. Some of them were actually quite good. This is one I did watch when I was a kid. I don't think it's particularly good. But let's take a look at how rapidly you could fire on these things. Now, obviously, these are blanks. The recoil is not apparent. So had he, he had you had real shells in there, this would have been more challenging. Um, he probably also had small, smaller rounds in here, which are pretty effective for, for close range, but they're not as effective at long ranges. Now, one thing, let's follow this video just for a few more seconds. So he does the flip, which you should never do. Oh, if you happen to do the flip, you put a bullet in your head or bullet in your foot. Anyway, he does the flip. <laughs> and notice what he's doing now. He, he can't really see it. It's off the corner. Of the but he's reloading it. He's putting it on the side. You say, wow, with the firepower. And this is tremendous, literally. Why wouldn't he use this weapon? Let's take a look at it. Okay. You're going like this. So, and I've counted numerous times, you count about 12 times when fires there. As I recall in reading about the Winchester, and I believe that this variant, this version has like 1892, that, the, that this, the Winchester was rapid, you could fire it rapidly, but its accuracy left a lot to be desired. That's okay, close range. But if you're firing out trench to trench, you know, several hundred yards, probably not your best gun. And it did have a tendency to jam. But notice when you're working the lever. When you're working the lever, let's say you're laying down in the trench, even standing up for that matter, it becomes cumbersome to do this. So the idea here is there's some inferiority. And of course, if you're laying down on the ground and move, move that lever, you can't have it push into the ground. You have to go off to the side. But the biggest single problem, it is slow to reload. And that, that is a real real big issue here. So you look at the Mauser up here. Okay. Come down here. Uh, as I, as I, I told you just a minute ago, 
the uh, they do vary somewhat in caliber. Now, of course, the French are using metrics. The Germans are as well. And the French are using their rifle 7.62. Now, they're not all using the Mauser, but they're using a variation of the Mauser. In other words, the same kind of action that the Mauser itself was using. First practical repeater, sure. 30 caliber, remember, the caliber is 1 one-hundredth of an inch. So we got three one-hundredths, 30 one-hundredths of an inch. The Germans a little bit heavier than that. Let me show you some World War I guns. This this is, I don't know how well you can see this because the screen is not terribly good, but this is a Russian version of the, what they were using in World War I. It is not technically a World War I gun because they were making these things for many years after the First World War. But the configuration is, is all the same. Now, one of the first things I should hazard to guess, anytime you're going to do anything with a gun, first thing you do is you see if it's empty or not. You say, well, I didn't load it last time. No, no. Every time you pick up a gun, the first thing you do, I don't care if it's a pistol or a rifle, the first thing you do is you look and see if it's empty or not. In this case, it happens to be empty. I'm very pleased to say that. Um, the real difference between the Russian guns, the Russian rifles, also machine guns, is they're using 30 caliber or 7.62. They're using this as a, it's a smaller bullet, smaller shell casing. But that's the real difference. Okay. See if I can release this without making too much trouble. Now, this other one I'd like to show you is, is a Mauser. This is what the Germans were using. This is essentially the same development. Of course, the earliest Mausers, as you, as you can see, came from the 1880s. Once again, the first thing you do, tell me you're playing with the gun, is you go in and you make sure that the thing is empty. Never point a gun empty or loaded at a human being. Uh, back when I was growing up, back when I was in college and high school, uh, we, had, we ran into a number of political assassinations. First one that we remember is John Kennedy, 1963, Martin Luther King, 1968, uh, Robert Kennedy, 1968, and George Wallace, governor of Alabama, 1972. By Utah State, when George Wallace had been killed, well, he wasn't killed, he was shot through the chest and he was paralyzed from the waist down for the remainder of his life. I don't know what I was doing. I went over and talked to a girl in an apartment I don't know why I, was, why I was there because none of those girls were interested in me and I wasn't interested in any of them, but I was there anyway. Maybe my roommates wanted me to come over. I don't remember the details. The same day we heard about George Wallace being shot. We didn't know if he was going to live or die. A girl, a woman, in the apartment came up with a twenty-two pistol. She ran up to me. She put it in my chest and click. Not funny. That's not funny. I didn't make a big stink over it. I didn't chew her out. I didn't blow a fuse, anything like that. But that's not funny. Uh, I did take it away from her. I did make sure it was empty. <clears throat> Don't play those kind of games. Any of it. This is this is your this is your your your. Uh, I believe this is a Yugoslav model. It is not identical. I think the front side is a little bit different, but the action is almost identical to what the Germans were using in the early development of the weapon. So we looked at the rifleman. Let's see one of the reasons why, why you tend to like this. Now, this is a clip. You see this five rounds. Almost all armies use the five round clip. Since this is a Mauser, it's a little bit larger caliber, a little bit wider. When I was a kid taking safety from the NRA, rifle safety from the NRA, the uh, Instructors said that during the First World War, so the Germans are using larger shells. Americans are using 30 caliber, as you can see the Germans slightly more than that. And he said that you could take a German round, it would actually fit, it would chamber, in other words, it would fit within the American guns. But when you fired American guns, it would, since it was larger, it would explode. Now, I'm not going to experiment and see if he's right on that. However, let's see what you can do. Notice this is a clip. This is a clip made for this weapon. I can place it right here, as you can see. And with my thumb, I could press this down and have five rounds right there at that time. So 
when you've shot your five rounds, you pull this out again, you put in another one of these. So as make a comparison to what we have over here, this is superior gun. It's rapid firing, it's very accurate, long distances, and it's very easy to reload. Now I'm not going to do this because I don't want to have a loaded gun sitting around here. But I want to give you an idea as to the nature of these things. I, I, I'm always amused by, by these things. Um, you can't see this, but they have, this will go out to what, 2,000 meters? I'm not sure why you can hit at 2,000 meters. But uh, let me close this off. Now, if you have, can you see this right here? This is your safety mechanism. It's down right now, so I can fire this. If I were to pull the trigger, here we go. Click. Uh, if you have have the safety on, you, the safety's up here. So now the safety's on. I cannot fire the weapon. Now, I can't show you this very easily, but see, it's up here. So if I were trying to sight and was trying to aim this thing, this would be in my way. This tells me that it's on safety and I cannot fire it. So I'd have to go like this, pull it down in order to fire. Now, let's not play with any more guns right now. All right, so how rapidly can you fire these things? The British Army has a standard practice. Every one of the persons, every one of the men in the British Army should be able to do 15 aim shots per minute. This is called the mad minute. In other words, this is shooting, this is reloading. And they you have a target, 48 inch square. What's 48 inches? Is that four feet? 48 inches square. Uh, 300 yards, you should be able to hit 15 aim shots. Now, I'm a terrible shot with a pistol. I don't usually embarrass myself with a rifle, but 300 yards? I don't know if I've ever even tried to take a shot at 300 yards. It's kind of an effort in foolishness, shall we say, because what am I going to hit at 300 yards? I probably couldn't hit a tree at 300 yards. So in order to meet this basic requirement of their infantrymen, the Germans, excuse me, I should say British, getting mucked up here. The British do have, I'm getting really mucked up. The British do have the have certain very high level of expertise Okay, let's show you what a Mad Minute's like. Let's go back to YouTube. Give you an idea of how rapidly you can fire these things. And how rapidly they can be reloaded. Huh. It's very easy to find yesterday. And now I'm having more trouble. It always happens. Everything works unless you want it to. Wish you didn't have to pay full price for Nintendo gear? Wikibuy can help with that. It automatically compares to uh, an audience. I was wondering about that. <laughs> okay, look at this. This is not a World War I version. In fact, because of the front sight, this is a World War II version of the Lee Enfield, which was used by the uh, British during the First World War. Let's give you an idea, however, though the action, the configuration is largely the same, even though the front sight is somewhat different. So let's show you a little bit more how to these things. Let's try that again. Oh, the bag wasn't seated. That's why it didn't. Let's try that again. Put another round It's obviously American to kill with the accent. Ready to go. Start. Notice how rapidly you can fire this. These are obviously live rounds. You can tell by the recoil. I'm not counting, but I'm sure they are. Now see how he reloads. He drops in the clip. Reload very easily. And you're up and, up and running again. 
Very impressive weapon. Very impressive weapon system. You can do an awful lot of damage very rapidly with these things. Notice he's going to reload here. Okay. Drop in the clip. And we're going again. I think I think I pretty well made my point uh, by uh, how rapidly these things can fire and how rapidly they can be reloaded. Now I'm off on this as well. Let's come down here. So the Mauser rifle, the Mad Minute. I'm not exactly sure what they mean by effective range. Uh, I, once again, if I can't hit anything at 300 yards, 800 yards is ludicrous. Now, a, a sniper, a man with a scope or something, could pro can do damage, can kill people a lot more than 300 yards. I guess maximum the, is about 800 yards or 800 meters. I showed you on the Mauser, maybe you couldn't see it, but I could. On the Mauser, the distance is up to 2,000 meters. And of course, that's that's a, that's an incredible distance. You really can't hit anything at that distance. I guess if a shell accidentally landed on you, it, it could do some damage. Another aspect in how we fight the First World War is the Maxim machine gun. The Maxim machine gun is, is developed by an American, Hiram Maxim. He is a Civil War era, as you can see. He would have been 20 in 1860 or 21 in 1861. Um, of course, he's very familiar with the weapons they were using at the time. The lever action repeater, which we've already showed you when I'm showing you a clip from the rifleman, was actually the first was like the Henry in 1866. And by the 1870s, you have the Winchester. There's variants of the Winchester that we're using for decades afterwards and continue developing that weapon. Max, the story about Maxim is this. He was out with one of these Winchesters. And I fired a 22 caliber, yeah, kind of Mickey Mouse. And so I have some idea as to the action, how rapidly you can fire them. And unfortunately, how slow it is to reload them. Maxim apparently was out firing one of these things. It has a, has a kick to it. Now, when it kicks a lot, you really have a problem. And sometimes these rifles, I've fired these rifles, which I showed you just a minute ago, they have a considerable kick to them. They can, they can hurt your shoulder. He's firing this mechanism. He's firing this Winchester. And he's getting the recoil. He's hurting his shoulder. And he realizes, what would happen if I could actually harness that and use the recoil to eject the shell and to reload another one. So when you hold the trigger down, you're tick, tick, bang, bang. Now you got a machine gun. He develops the first modern repeating machine gun. Uh, the Maxim variations, we're going to see variations in the British Army, Russian Army, but they're essentially the same mechanism which Maxim developed. Now he starts doing his invention. In the United States. But the United States has a small military. So he's not going to have as many contracts to make these weapons. He goes to Britain and Europe where, he's, where, they, where they're building up their militaries quite rapidly so he can sell these more. Air or water cooled. <clears throat> Let's look at a maxim here. The Maxim machine gun. Can I show you? We have firing demonstrations. Uh, there's uh, one I would like to show you that where they're actually cutting down a tree with it. Can we cut down a tree with this? Say, look, see if we can. See the fire part is tremendous. Doubles, um, you see all these balls whizzing by you, saying, "Oh, Martina I should have that. That's because you.
Bob Podesta. See, now we're walking out and they're going to choose a tree. Story by trying I'll leave this up in Scotland. Let's find a tree. In the British that Island. seems to work pretty well. Ah, what do you reckon? So let's take this tree. This let's is a 1916 get... Vickers gun. 1960 the Vickers. Variation on Hiram Maxim's design now Vickers London business fired at 450 rounds. It's capable of firing 450 rounds per But they're minute. saying the but faster ones, enough, the most the traditional Maxims, fire 600 power. rounds a minute. That's 10 rounds a second. So let's see what this thing will do to a tree. Podesta aims to maximize his chances with a methodical approach based on years of experience. I don't know how many inches that is across. Looks like about 20 inches when you Firing agree with that. Firing in short bursts is the army approved machine gun technique. Continuous fire could overheat and distort the barrel, affecting accuracy. Also blow up. But Podesta must be careful. A rotating wheel in the firing mechanism could easily smash his knuckles. He's already weakened the right-hand side of the tree. Now can he take out the left from the center? Every round is striking home. The thumping recoil of the barrel is clearly visible at the muzzle. Podesta ups the firing rate, sensing victory. Notice, if you can cut down a tree with one of these machine guns, what will that do to a human being? I mean, you can literally tear a man to shreds with one of these things. Remember, this is the Vickers. This is the slower rate of fire. Many of these guns used by the French and the Germans have a more rapid rate of fire. You can see 60 rounds a minute is 10 rounds a second. You can take an automobile and literally turn it into a heap of trash in a matter of seconds. I remember reading about the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, where U.S.-backed Cuban refugees came in and tried to invade Cuba. According to the story which I read, this account that a man, a, a, a Cuban, stood in front of the headlights ordering these American-backed Cubans to surrender. And the guy was so furious the American back human so furious, he, he literally cut the man in half with the machine gun. Same rate of fire which you're seeing right here. See, this, this can do severe damage to a human being. Can we say one machine gun can fire as fast as 30 to 40 men? No doubt about that at all. Something else we want to take a look at here is that when men fire a rifle, bang, bang, you have to notice when we were showing this man firing, you fire, you aim, you fire, you aim. With a machine gun, you can walk it in. Oh, I'm a little low, a little high. You can walk it in, and each by each round, it becomes more and more accurate. Now, let me tell you a little bit about, about the weapon. Remember, warped weapons, in other words, dum-dums, weapons that will flatten when you hit your body, that is illegal according to the Hague Conventions. We'll talk about the laws of war later on. Uh, these things go very high velocity, and very often when they hit your body, you can see the size of the bullet right here. This, when it hits your body, it's going at such a high velocity. Sometimes that when it hits the point here, will instantaneously, literally, will be going a little bit slower when it hits the flesh and the back is, which means the, the thing will tumble. It won't tumble. It will actually just warp over like that. So you can see, you see this in, in wounds and corpses where the bolts will go in here as a whole and come out here larger. This is what happened to the Red Baron, who was the number one combat air ace in the First World War, who was killed in April 1918, probably by ground fire, probably from a, a weapon from a, from a British machine gun that went through his body and came out the other side. He's dead in a matter of seconds. The bullet 
drills through you, you say, well, it makes a hole, right? Well, of course it does, but the velocity is going so heavily through through your body, and as it tumbles, it turns just a little bit. It actually is like a sonic boom in your body. It, it actually does more damage to your internal organs in areas where it's not directly next to the round going through. It actually does damage in a larger area. So these things are, of course, very, very lethal indeed. <clears throat> we hear a lot about machine guns in the First World War. We should. Mowing down men, literally just cutting them to ribbons, that is absolutely well documented. It happened over and over and over again. However, as we look at what killed men, we got, we got the Maxim, we got the Mauser rifle, but actually what killed men more often was artillery. We usually say like 50 percent of the 50 to 60 percent of the deaths in the First World War were caused by artillery, while the remainder would be rifle fire or machine guns. They were doing studies, these ridiculous studies during the First World War. You come into hospitals where men had been wounded, and you examine them. Well, how were you hit? Uh, well, I was hit. And <laughs> uh, we hit with the artillery. We hit with machine gun. More often, they said machine guns. You say, well, maybe more people were killed therefore by machine guns. Well, if you're hit by an artillery piece, you're not around talking about it. If you're hit by an artillery piece, usually you're dead quite rapidly. So can we say more men were wounded by machine guns and rifle fire, and more men were killed by artillery? One of these ridiculous things, I was reading a story about an American. It's called Over the Top by Arthur Guy, Guy M.P., a guy from Ogden, who joined the British Army in 1915. On the Somme in 1916, he was wounded. And people are in the hospital telling him or asking what was it like. <laughs> he said that, they, that these people asked him, well, did it hurt worse when the bullet came in or when it came out? I don't think you'd be in a position to make that judgment. Of course, he made light of that idiotic question. Artillery does kill more men. Origins of the war. Let's start talking in a broader sense. Now, I need to see where I'm at. So I don't go over, not too bad, and I don't go under. Let's take a look at the origins of the war. This is a, some of our discussion dealing, dealing with the theory of war. We'll talk a little bit later about politics. Right now, let's talk a little about theory of war. Can we say one of the great military theorists of all time was Carl von Clausewitz. Clausewitz wrote a book, which he published, as you can see, in 1832, called Vom Krieger. In English translation, it's on war. It's a very, very good book. It's been around now, as you can see, close to two centuries. And military theorists are still very impressed with it. When you study military history, a lot of times in various courses at various universities, this is required reading. And he talks about the importance of battle. He calls it the fight. No matter how it comes down to it, it's the fight. And he talks about deployment of troops and all these kind of things. Very, very interesting. For our purposes, let me point out this. This is perhaps one of his most famous quotes, or uh, if not the most famous quote, and that is, War is a continuation of politics by other means. Do we really see a scenario in which you just have like mob action, but mob A and mob B getting together and going, going at each other? I'm not saying that does, doesn't happen, but I am saying it's very, very difficult for people to, to sustain that. I mean, wars are terribly costly. You have to have weapons. You have to have ammunition. You have to have uniforms. You have to have the ability to supply people. If you just have neighbors or people in different valleys going at each other, it's very hard to sustain that. In other words, you have to have, have an economy. You have to have a government behind you to make sure that you can maintain the war. Armies are sent to war by their governments. They are supplied and supported by their governments in the state. They are there for a purpose, which happens to be the government purpose. In other words, we can say that war is there for political reasons. 
And Clausewitz, I'm sure, is quite correct in this manner. Well, why would you go to war? Let's look at economic and, and colonial rivalries. What is happening in Europe before 1914? We have various nations. I've already mentioned all these. World War I, Italy, Austria, Germany, France, Britain. And uh, there are rivalries. There's competition between them, one of which is economic. Europe is industrializing very rapidly in the 19th century. In the 18th century, going back to, we usually say the British lead out, and they do. They're the first to start the manufacturing process by the use of, of advanced machinery. By the time you get to the 19th century, we have nations like Belgium, and France, and Germany, and Russia uh, <clears throat> that are industrializing very rapidly. We see economic rivalries. If you don't like each other anyway, and a lot of countries don't, let's look at France and Germany. When Germany industrializes very rapidly, the French say, we can't lag behind. We can't lag behind economically because if we do so, Germany has more wealth and it has more potential military ability. So let's, let's compete. That's usually not enough to explain war. It is usually helpful so, somewhat to explain international feelings and sometimes governments don't like each other. Sometimes these animosities go back for, for many centuries, sometimes even back into the Middle Ages. Colonial rivalries, particularly in the late 19th century, we see the British and the French and the Italians and Germans trying to grab overseas colonies. In about 1878, 1880, about 10% of Africa is controlled or owned by European powers. By 1914, it's 90%. Only Liberia and Ethiopia are not in control of the European power. Okay, so what's happening? So we go to colonial Africa, uh, perhaps our best example. Let's go to colonial Africa. Let's get a map. That was kind of fun because it's so colorful. As you all know, the British tend to use red as their national color. When the Americans are fighting the Redcoats, they're wearing red. So usually when you see Britain on a map, it's either red or pink. Notice how beautifully red this is. The French national color, color has a tendency to be blue. When the French came over to aid the United States in the War of Independence, they're wearing blue uniforms. So when we see maps representing the holdings of France, they have a tendency to be blue. Well, Britain with its navy has a strong tendency to arrive first grabbing the best colonies. And that's true in Africa as well. After the First World War, this area was owned by Germany. After the First World War, when the Germans are kicked out of Africa, Britain actually has it all the way down here. Literally from the Mediterranean to Cape Town. The French are moving in this direction at the same time. Uh, this is desert, not nearly as adva advantageous. You can see the French are essentially moving in this direction. The British are moving in this direction. Is there a possibility right here in the Sudan you might have a clash? There's a possibility. We, we're competing over colonies, but in reality, they don't go to war over this. But there are feelings, shall we say, feelings between nations because of the colonial rivalries. And we're, we're about out of time. Doggone it, it's just getting good and I'm getting into this. However, do not despair. This is lecture two. I will continue this discussion at this point when we get to lecture three. In the meantime, continue to have your fine history day and I'll talk to you next time.